Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forever. So what is it to come in the name of the Messiah, in the name of the Father? And for that matter, what is the true name? Why is there so much debate <laughs> and confusion over it, if it's so simple? Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for being a part of this very special share where we will see that the answer to both those questions is truly the same answer as we explore the reciprocal nature between the highest and his people. Yahweh, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Yahawashai, Emmanuel. The oh so controversial Jesus. There is much discussion and debate over the name of our Messiah. But in all the variants I've mentioned, they are interpreted with an understanding of salvation. In considering his name, what we debate, family, are usually the semantics of men. Things like pronunciation, the spelling, the history of letters, origin of syntax, and things of that nature are of men. We argue pronunciation when truly we don't even know how the language sounded. And it's really irrelevant because his true language is not spoken, but revealed, witnessed, experienced, and mirrored, just like his name. The Father reveals himself, his glory, his righteousness to us when we seek him when we are in him, when our house is in his house, when we dwell with him and the Messiah. John 14, 2 tells us that in his house are many mansions. The Hebrew word for in is bet. It is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it is the picture of a tent, the dwelling, the house. We dwell with the Father and the Son, and they dwell with us when in spirit. When we are in his name, we are in his spirit, and his spirit is in us. We speak in the spirit. We understand in the spirit. We pray and praise in the spirit. We know him and he knows us because once you are in the house, you are in the spirit. The Father knows you through the Spirit, and by the Spirit. It is the Spirit that aligns us with the will of the Father, directing us to the mediator that is Christ, the connecting force that reveals his name to all that follow him. And when in and following that Christ mind, you have truth. So the name we desire to be in, that our salvation is built upon, must be understood must be revealed, must be received, must be followed, and must, must be worshipped in spirit and truth. Scripture tells us he is the Lord who heals, the Lord who sanctifies, the Lord our peace. He is our banner, our redeemer, our righteousness. These are only a few of many titles attributed to him. And none of them alone can encompass the fullness of him. And how could they, right? When he's the Alpha and Omega, or even better represented in the Hebrew, the Aleph and the Tav, because the Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, shows us, yokes us to, and trains us in the power and authority of the strong leader we follow. And the Tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the mark 
that we aim for and that separates us from the world. It is the sign, it is the signal, it is the cross we bear, it is the monument, it is the covenant, it is truth. It is the name. This mark is a seal. This mark is the same mind that was in Christ. The mind that is Christ. Name in Hebrew is Shem. That same Shem that is the third part of the sonship of Noah. Shem is the son that is the progenitor of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel, the lineage of promise, the seed and generations our Messiah is conceived through and in. Israel means he shall rule as God, to strive with God. And they are the people the hires enters covenant with to be his people to become sons. The Apostle Paul speaks of this covenant in Romans 9, 4 through 5, saying, Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Christ was in and born out of the flesh of Israel, but also came to the flesh of Israel. In fact, Matthew fifteen twenty four tells us he was but sent to the house of Israel. John 1, 11 tells us he came to his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. As many that believe on him gave he power to become the sons of God. Let's look closer at what it is to believe on his name. When we study Amon, the Hebrew word for believe, then we can understand that to believe on him is not only knowing the truth of God and believing in it, but it is also to be faithful to God and follow the way of Christ. And that is done by keeping his commandments that have been given unto Israel. John fourteen twelve, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also and greater. I hope this helps to shed some light on the work versus faith battle that's going on out there. Faith is simply this. When you believe in Christ, you follow Christ and works you shall do because we are servants of the highest and it's our calling. We are called for this purpose to be about our father's business, to do his work, not our own works in our own name conceived out of our own mind that we profess with our mouths to be in his name. Matthew seven twenty one through 23, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall, I, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Our father is a reader of hearts, and he knows the deepest intention and desire within our hearts, within our deeds. Pray for the new heart that Holy Spirit brings, and that heart that mind will lead us into understanding of the Father's business and not idle actions and deeds that we perform to self-profess his name. But through his spirit, we will understand the direction, the action, the deeds that the Father wills for us. And we will always do what pleases him.
It is his spirit that provides the desire to do his will. Israel, the lineage of promise, is in covenant to uphold the truth of God's kingdom through the statutes and the judgments that the highest has bestowed upon them. Psalms 147, 19 through 20, he showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise you the Lord. Now let's take a look at the word on to go yet deeper into what it is to believe on him. On in Hebrew is on and has an understanding of upon, which we will consider in relation to believe on Christ or believe upon Christ. Upon in Hebrew is al, and amongst its meanings is accordance, alongside, as in, with, together, crowns, as in rulership, steward, and stewards manage the house, the lands. It means above, over, as in presiding, because stewards have dominion. And it also means within and named. We are within Christ, who is in the Father. The name gives us power and authority over the portion of the house of the estate in which we are stewards. Consider this understanding with the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. We can see the governorship left to the stewards to provide increase. They are expected to take what has been given them by their master and do works that increase, works that will make his posterity greater. And posterity speaks to lineage, future generations, to believe upon, to be in the name is to follow the way of Christ. When we follow the way of Christ, we are shown all things of Christ and become as of like Christ and are stewards of his posterity. God's posterity, made in the image of Christ, in the image of the Father. And here we are, full circle, because the end, the highest declared from the beginning. Genesis one twenty six. let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. So oftentimes, we read this passage and only see the natural understanding of it. But let's understand that passage through a spiritual understanding. It speaks to the stewardship, the dominion that is bestowed unto man when made in the image of the Father. We bear his name because we become sons, much in the way of our last names. They represent the house from which we descend, our lineage maintained from the line of our father and forefathers. Well, when we come in the name of the father, it is his house, his lineage we uphold as children of the highest. The entirety of creation awaits for those of the father to return to the authority of their land. This land, this portion is the Christ mind. Romans 8, 18 through 22, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to compare, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature 
waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Throughout scripture, we see the significance of the name and we understand there is power and authority in that name. This is a great understanding because it's everything. Everything connected to it is intertwined with it. Scripture reveals that our very portion of the kingdom lies within it. And to know the name is to know the father. The word in Hebrew, the word know in Hebrew is Yadah and speaks to the intimacy of the relationship by which we know the father and he knows us. He gives us the illustration of the sanctity of marriage, the unity of knowing the wife. It describes the oneness of the Christ mind within the father and his people. To know him and be known by him is to be one with him. It's consummation. So what is it? His name, his name is a collection or gathering of his glory as manifest in his people, Israel. And his glory is life. The people are the body of which Christ is the head. John 1, 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. When in the name, you are light, reflections of the very glory that is Christ, that is the Father. Too often we seek the name of the Father and Son by an understanding forged and formed by the world. But how can we shape that which has no confounds? God is a spirit. How can we seek to attach a title of singularity to the force that is everything. In the book of Judges, an angel of the Lord comes to Manoah and his wife to tell them of Samson's conception. And Manoah asked the angel of the Lord his name so they may do, do honor for him. And the angel of the Lord said, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Now, it helps us to know a couple of things here. One, any angel of the Lord, an angel means messenger in Hebrew, but any angel of the Lord comes in the Lord's name. Any servant of the Lord comes in the Lord's name because we do his will. Also, the angel said his name is wonderful and wonderful in Hebrew means hard to be understood. He said his name is secret and secret in Hebrew means incomprehensible. Beyond comprehension, a knowledge that is of the father. We see a similar illustration presented when Jacob is wrestling in Peniel and consequent to that struggle, his name is changed from Jacob to Israel. Jacob had asked the name of the man he was struggling with, and the response was, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? The name fam is represented in the spiritual nature of our existence, of our manifestation, of our becoming. Take note at the beginning of his struggle. Jacob is wrestling with what scripture calls a man. But at the end of his struggle, his plight, his journey, he names that place Peniel and says, For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Indicating that Israel recognized the struggle with God. His name was changed from Jacob to Israel because it was stated that as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. 
To gain a fuller understanding of the word name, Shem, let's understand it in its Hebrew context. For most languages, such as English, a name has only become a moniker, an identifier of person. For example, Kim. While Kim surely had some significance of meaning in its origin, it has little recognized connection any longer with that original meaning for most of us. We choose names now based on what we think sounds pretty, looks pretty, is popular and trendy, in honor of family members, things like that. But in Hebrew, and in particular in relation to scripture, names are not arbitrary. They have meaning and are decisively given in relation to one's character. And they often illustrate, bear witness, and testify to the glory of the Most High. For example, Judah means praise, or Yehuda in its Hebrew means praise. Zechariah means God has remembered. Israel, he shall rule as God. God strives. John, the Lord has been gracious. David means the loved one. And when we, we give these monikers, the moniker of Zechariah, we, we call that name Zechariah, but what it is, is a testament of that spirit of what God is calling us into, which is remembrance. So when we read these books with these names or, or read scripture, it is to our benefit to know what the name means, to read the book of Zechariah, understanding that this book is about remembrance. As we read scripture, we understand that even the cities and places are given names that become demonstrative of events of distinguishment. We saw, or I, I gave the example of Jacob naming the land that he wrestled with God, Peniel. Another example is when Jacob enters into covenant with his father-in-law, Laban. They gathered stones as witness between them, and Jacob named that area they were in, Galid, which means witness pile. Memorial of Stones. So a name in scripture, whether of a person, a city, or as in, in, in this example, a memorial of occasion, the name is a testament to something. The name bears witness. And to be in the name of the Messiah is to bear witness of him. And that is only done through the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that reveals him to us so that we may know him. Shem means character, byword, defamed, famous, memorial, named, report. And it also means same names. And same names is important to understand because you are in Christ. You are in the Father and there is oneness of character, of name, of purpose, of mind. You follow when in Christ. Through these meanings, we can see how they culminate into an understanding of not just the meaning of name, of Shem, but they tie together the relationship scripture presents to us of the Most High and his people. And this relationship is of a reciprocal nature. We receive all glory from the Father, and we return all glory to the Father. His people, Israel, that were in covenant of the name of the Father, are fallen people cast out. They made his name a byword through their ill representation of the name and their desire to make a name for themselves, a name outside of the highest. And in so doing, they breached their covenant and defamed the name of the highest, brought it low through self-worship and idolization of the world, putting their own desires before the will of the Father. We see this in the garden with Adam, Eve, and the serpent, and we see it at the Tower of Babel. 
the same oneness they sought then is sought now. This world seeks to establish its own name and change the truth of God into a lie. Because as Romans 1.19 tells us, that which may be known of God is manifest in his people. For God has showed it unto them. Showed what? His word, his statutes, and his judgments. Genesis 11.4, and they said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They were building not just a tower, but also a city where they could establish their own ordinance, administration, oneness of mind, their own way, the broad path. The confounding of the language that the verses here speak of are not so much the verbal and oral word. We see in Genesis 10 that the sons of Noah were already grouped by their tongues. No, this division illustrated is of character. The name they were seeking and that they agreed as one should be their own name. But for the sake of his name and through his grace, the highest returns those that are his through his Holy Spirit, which shows us all things of Christ. We are returned to the house of God that is Christ and restored for his glory. The house of Israel is the elect family that bears the name of the Messiah, of the Father, because Christ comes in the name of the Father, and that name is manifest in all that are his by their character. The root word of Shem is sum, and amongst its meanings are appoint, ordained, transformed, and made to become in the likeness. Made to become in the likeness, again reiterating, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. This is the return to the garden, the perfection of mind. That is what it means for us to be in the name, and it is the name, those that are returned to the likeness of his glory and for his glory. And those that are called in his name will share what they have received with others who are seeking and call upon the name of the Lord. This is what it means to be fruitful and multiply. Romans 10, 13 through 15, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Because remember, as we discussed earlier, to truly believe, you must follow. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Family, those who are set apart, are made holy, renewed, and made in the image of his name to bear witness of Christ. When Christ dwells in you, you are a voice of one crying or calling, because that's what crying means here, to call, to shout. You are a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. Luke 13, 34 through 35, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, thy house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. All that have received the Holy Spirit bear witness to the revelation of Christ. We come in the name of the Lord. Messengers are sent in the same way that we, we read at the beginning of the book of Revelation. To be in his name is to become the spiritual and physical embodiment, testament, tribute of his spirit. 
The name is a spiritual understanding that is not bound by words, but displayed and demonstrated through our character, through our worship. The word worship is limiting as we understand it. Most think of it as our morning and evening prayers, our church services, our good deeds that we make time for in our busy lives, our tithes, our communing with fellow believers. And this is some of what worship means. However, I am speaking of the worship it takes to be in his holy name. And that is a life. Your life. That has been given to the father. A life that no longer has you in command of it. Your words are not your words. Your thoughts are not your thoughts. You have relinquished or are relinquishing all sense of self and seek or do operate symbiotically. You live in him, through him, and for him. We are only able to achieve this level of worship once we are called and agree to the terms of the covenant that binds us to his Holy Spirit. When Moses asked unto God, who should I tell the children of Israel it is that sent him? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That, dis that statement describes all that are in the name. He is all. Let's more closely examine I am that I am. M in Hebrew is Haya and means turn as in repentance. Keep as in John 14, 15, Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And keep is Shamar in Hebrew. You'll notice it's similar to Shem and means to preserve, guard, protect, perform, mark. Let's continue with the meaning of Haya. To turn as in repentance, keep, it means followed, exists, become, come to be, to quit oneself, became his and lived. <laughs> quit oneself, stop living for your own interest and become his and have true life. Who is his? Christ and through him is life, meaning we were not even living until becoming his and to be his means as we just heard, to turn, repent, keep and follow his commandments. We see the reciprocity in the name. The people are becoming the name of the father and the father manifests himself in this new man, this new creation. As stated earlier, all of creation is for his glory and testifies to it. The transformation of Israel, the becoming. Remember, Israel means he shall rule as God. When we consider Ahaya Shir Ahaya with this understanding, then we can see that through Christ, the highest is in his people and the people are in the highest. The highest is not bound, is not confined to the limitations of a name. He is who he is. He is that he is. He is what he creates. Christ tells us when you see him, you see the father. And when you are in the name of the father, you are a son by which we cry, Abba, father, right? And as sons, we bear in the same such way as Christ, we bear witness. Because the same mind that is in Christ, the mind of the highest, is also in us. Once we have his spirit and are in obedience to, possessed by that spirit, when you see any that are in the name of the Father, you see the Father. Because we are the physical manifestation of the invisible spirit that is God. His creation is where we find him, where we see him. Haya also means to have a place, and that place is within Christ. 
within the household of God, within Christ, there is life. It means belongs, possession, and possessed. He possesses that vessel that belongs to him. He makes a bold within that vessel. John 14, 23 reads, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father and I will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Haya also means married. When his Holy Spirit occupies his vessel, there is union as in marriage. You know him. He knows you. You come into the household of God. Remember the bed? meaning family, house, to be in. But you don't come into this house without exemplifying the traits of it, without glorifying the traits of it, without being the traits of it. There are house rules to every home. And in the bet, you must be of the same mind that is in Christ Jesus. I am that I am. That in Hebrew is a share and means who, which, that, whatever, whoever, wherever, whichever, everything. So to be, I am that I am. The father tells us he is that, who, which, anyone, whatsoever, whosoever he possesses. He is not limited to any singularity or definition and definitely cannot be limited within the constructs of a name, especially by way in which we understand a name. He is all and all of his creation is created for his glory. And when we are called by his name, if, if we heed the call, we come in the power and authority of the union of the contract, because to be called in his name is contractual. To be his people is contractual, a covenant. In fact, call in Hebrew is Korah. I hope you see the beauty of this Hebrew and why we should get closer to it. Korah, like Haya, also means become. It means guess and guess may bring to mind for us the parable of the wedding banquet where guests were invited, called to the wedding, the kingdom. And there was one man who didn't have on a wedding garment. And when discovered, the king had the servants bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, if we choose Christ, then we can't show up in the garments of this world. We have to be geared up when we are called, or if we call upon him, we must choose ye this day how we will adorn ourselves. If we will put on Christ, the full armor of God, or continue naked in this world. And if Christ, we must honor the terms of his name. Another meaning for Korah, called, is offer it terms. Korah means offer it terms. We have to be ready to honor the covenant. We see this covenant represented in 2 Corinthians seven sixteen through 22, Hebrews 8 and 13, Jeremiah 31 and 31, the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy 28. We see it in John six fifty six. It is illustrated in the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see this union, this agreement in the life and the death of Christ. This covenant is in all that God possesses and it is throughout scripture. To be in his name is to be in agreement to live his name, to be the light to the world that is his name, to be the keeper, the way that is his name. And this is a choice. Choose ye this day, family. So when understanding the name, our focus should always be on the spiritual nature of our becoming, of our being within Christ and the Father. It is the will of the Father to restore his name for his name's sake. And this is done through what we call the new covenant that is established within Christ. 
Now, the new covenant is not really new. It's the same covenant with the same people. The covenant has always been that the people of God would know him and keep his law, statutes, and judgments. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. We see the covenants. We see this in the covenants of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with David throughout the book of Judges when the highest would raise up a judge to show Israel the way. And we see it in Christ. Through Christ, the law of God and the law of sin is reconciled as he overcame sin and death in and through the flesh of Israel. 1 John 5, 6, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. Christ born through the flesh of Israel fulfills the law and imparts the way of life to his own through the gift of the Holy Spirit that he sends. As we see in John 16, 7 and Romans 8, 3, Paul speaks of this reconciliation of the law of God and the law of sin within himself in Romans 7, 25, stating, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So the covenant here is not new. But the way has been made through Christ to receive the Holy Spirit within our hearts and our minds, not just the cleansing of the flesh, but of the heart and the mind. So that we may know him, not only through the words of those that testify of him, but for ourselves, as in John 439 through 42. The word New in Hebrew is Kadash, Strong's 2318. It means to renew, to repair, to rebuild, to restore. It means regenerate, be rejuvenated, fresh, or cool. Cool. Does cool sound familiar? Does cool sound familiar? We are returned to a time when man could hear God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This restored day, this renewed day, this day made fresh again in your mind. So the new covenant is not truly new as we think of the word new, but undergoes a regeneration, a repair, a renewal. Matthew 26, 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it for this, my blood of the new Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Notice it reads, his blood is shed, not for all, but for many. Why? Because as stated earlier in John 1 11, it tells us he came to his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The passage continues at Matthew, Matthew 26 and 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. That is to say, when we are one in Christ, when your mind has been renewed in the way of Christ, when the three bear record in heaven and the three bear witness on earth, and we are of one accord. 
This renewal of covenant is seen in Ezekiel 36, 16 through 21. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for the idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. A little further down, the verse continues at Ezekiel thirty-six twenty-three through 27, stating, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. The semantics of the name, the title of the name as we consider it, is not important. Our minds should be stayed upon what we need to do to know his name, to attain his name, to glorify his name, to be in the character of his name. We overcome the world through our being the name and our focus should be on the manifestation of his name, returning the glory of God to him. And that is done by his people being manifest into his name his name is not so much something that we speak it is something that we live he lives and expresses himself through the people so when when someone wants to see god they should see god manifest in you you should be the character of that manifestation that's where we have to keep our focus a rose by any other name, if it's a rose, will smell just as sweet. Let's close out with Second Corinthians 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now mine eyes be open, and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Thank you for joining me.